V. Ramachandra. At present, he is the coordinator of Energy and Wetlands Research Group, or EWRG, and convener of Environmental Information System, ENVIIS, at the Center for Ecological Sciences. Dr. Ramachandra has conducted prolific research in the fields of energy and environment. He is also a member of prominent bodies like the National Wetland Committee, Karnataka State Wetland Authority, Kerala Wetland Authority, and others. And he has received numerous awards like the Kar Karnataka State Pari Parisara Award, ENVIS Award, Johnny Biosphere Award for Eco Ecology and Environment. And we are extremely pleased to have him here. So I'll hand the floor over now to Dr. Ramachandra. Recording in progress. Okay, I'm sharing the slides. Well, I'm talking about the why we need to conserve the wetlands. So that is an ecosystem-based adaptation of the climate change. As you all know, changes in climate is happening because of the warming of the earth or the global warming. The global warming happens because of the emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions. Now the wetlands help in mitigating the greenhouse gas emissions and also ensure the sustenance of natural resources. Now with this background, uh, today I'll be talking about ecosystem services. What are the worth of the wetland? The work, what we have done in Karnataka and uh, how it helps in bioremediation and how we can conserve the wetland. And finally, I will share some of the success stories in Karnataka and other parts of the country. Okay, now when we look at the wetland services, we all know that wetlands, uh, the any ecosystem provide the provisioning, regulating and cultural services. Provisioning services in terms of the fish, food, washing cloth, that is the water, agriculture, etc. Then regulating services include the groundwater recharge, bioremediation, carbon sequestration, or moderating the microclimate. Then the, the cultural services is the recreation, spiritual, education, etc. Now to sustain these services, we need to manage the ecosystem. That is where the maintaining the catchment integrity or the maintaining the ecological integrity of an ecosystem becomes important. So now let us try to understand what is this ecosystem integrity. See, when you look at any ecosystem, for example, the terrestrial ecosystem, you see a, there is a, the food chain. There is a balance among the, the entities in the food chain, the producer, producer of food. Then it is consumed by the next level. Then when you look at that, there is the material and energy transfer happens and whatever is left in the system is getting converted into elemental form by the bacteria and fungi. That means the ecosystem has the ability to manage the maintain the balance at the same time also maintain the, the quality of the ecosystem. So now let us look at the, the catchment integrity or the ecological integrity. I will share an example of a region of the last uh, the three decades See, in 91, when I was a student, there was abundant water in the region. And today in the same region, the same month, I do not have the water. So this, when you look at this, this could be because of the, the, the erosion of the catchment or the watershed in the region. Now to understand that, let us go to the river, bay, uh, that uh, region. See, if you look at this base, uh, the region, you will see that one part of the basin has a dense network of the stream, other part do not have the dense network. And if you look at the land cover in the region, the one part is dominated by the native species vegetation, while the other part it is the, the agriculture and the degraded land. Now when you look at this catchment, you see that there is undulating terrain, and uh, when you, if you want to see what changes are happened because of the changes in land cover in this region, see, if you look at this, uh, the last 100, the 100 years rainfall data, they, it shows that 1901 to 1964, this region, entire region was receiving the rainfall of nine, uh, the 3,000 to 4,500. Now, when you look at from 1965 to today, when you look at this portion continues to receive 3,000 to 4,500, while the other portion started getting 1,700 to 1,900 millimeter. So that means the alteration in the catchment integrity also changes the rainfall. Now to understand this better, let us go to the each subbasin, try to understand, look at what is the forest cover and the rainfall. When you look at this on the eastern side, that is on this side, 
they, you will see that forest cover is 30 percent, rainfall is 1776. Or on the western side, when you look at forest cover is 65 percent, rainfall is 4800. Or forest cover is 60 percent, rainfall is 4400. This establishes the linkage between the, the vegetation in the catchment to the rainfall. Now, to understand how long the people get the water in the wetland, let, uh, we have conducted a study for 36 months. We have monitored the select region and we have looked at what is the water, the quantity of water availability and how long it uh, flows. Now, if the water is available 12 months in the region, it is graded as A. If it is for eight months, B. If it is six months, C. And if it is only during monsoon, it is as a graded as D. Now, when you look at A type of uh, the wetlands occur, when the When we convert the catchment into monoculture plantations, you have the, the B or C type of uh, the, the water availability. That means eight to six months of water availability. When we degrade the catchment uh, with a vegetation cover less than 30%, you have the water only during the four months. Now, to summarize what I said so far, this is the region where you have the water for 12 months. Green are the one for eight months, yellow are the six months, and this is the four months. Now, when you look at the land cover, See, wherever forests are intact, wherever vegetation is intact, you have the 12 months water. Wherever the vegetation is fragmented, you have eight to six months of water, depending on the, the extent of degradation. And where the vegetation cover is less than uh, the 30%, uh, you see the water available only during the four months. We have also looked at how the vegetation plays a role in sustaining the water. We did the measurement, uh, we put the sensors in the underlying layer, we looked at how when it rains, how much water goes to the underlying layer, and after monsoon, how much water flows laterally uh, to the, the, the lake uh, the, during the post-monsoon. See, during monsoon of four months, you have water because of the rain. The, the post-monsoon, the water available in this region comes to the lake for the next uh, eight months. Now, when you look at the, the catchment, you see that about 40 to 60 percent of the infiltration happens when the catchment is dominated by native species vegetation. Where our catchment is uh, degraded, you see there is not much infiltration. So now the amount of water that gets into the underlying layer along with the runoff, they sustains the activities in the region. Now uh, you see that available. Wherever, whereas in this region, there's a scarcity of water. You see that because there is not uh, enough the infiltration of the water in the underlying layer. So this highlights we need to maintain the catchment integrity to make the, the lakes or the wetland, the, the, uh, the perennial, and also to sustain the water in the wetland. We have published this in the current sign. Those who are interested can uh, download this article and read, okay? So then, let us try to understand the linkages with the biodiversity. This gives the diversity of the fauna. You see that wherever the water is available 12 months, the animals are there. They, they serve. Wherever water scarcity is there, only two-legged animal occurs there. So now, if you want to understand the importance of this region, these are the two species of fish which we have described, which has a medicinal value. Now, this fish, it occurs in this region where water is available 12 months. That means this fish tells us there is a linkage between the aquatic and the terrestrial biodiversity. That means for the water to be in the, the uh, lake, you need to have the vegetation of native species, diverse vegetation of native species. That is where it, uh, the linkages between the biodiversity and the, 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 the fauna, the, the, you know, the medicinal properties become evident. Now let us try to understand if there is no water on the earth, what will happen? Let us uh, take an example of a frog. We all know the frogs are known as amphibian because there are two stages in the life cycle. The first stage is a juvenile stage or the tadpole stage. The next stage is adult stage. Now, if there is no water on the earth, what will happen to the juvenile stage? The frogs cannot survive. The tadpole stage cannot happen. Now, this particular species of frog, Philetus leucorhinus, you know, after fertilization of the egg, in the case of the water scarce situation, it has bypassed the tadpole stage and we see the younger ones emerging out on the 14th or 15th day, which shows that animals have learned how to get adapted to a newer situation of the water scarcity. But the, with the scarcity of water or with the water not being there on the earth, you will not, the, no humans can survive on the earth. That's what we learned from this uh, study. 
And uh, another important thing we learned was the livelihood aspect. See, the farmers in this region, if they earn 1,54,000 rupees per acre per year, farmers in this region earn only 32,000 rupees per acre per year. That's mainly because since the water is available throughout the year, farmers can grow multiple crops or a cash crop, while the farmers in this region can grow only one crop. And more importantly, because of the native species vegetation in the catchment, the uh, you know the biodiversity is very good in the form of the the pollinators. The pollinators are diverse and they abundant because of that pollination become efficient. That's where the yield of the crop is also higher. For example, the paddy the yield is about uh, fourteen to sixteen quintal per acre in this region. Here you see the the yield is only six to eight quintals per acre. So now if the, for a country like India where the 65% of people depend on the agriculture, it is necessary to maintain the sustenance of the water in the wetland. That is where the catchment integrity plays a very decisive role. So now with this, let us move to the Bangalore. As you all know, the Bangalore, when you look at it, it is also known as a Silicon City of India. The current the spatial extent of Bangalore is 740 square kilometer. If you look at the, the topography of the region, it's like a small hill. Now, if you want to look at how changes have happened in Bangalore over the last two centuries, in the, the 1800s, in this region, we had interconnected lakes, 1,452, and 82% is the vegetation cover. And because of that, temperature in this region uh, during the May month, that is summer, was 14 to 16 degrees Celsius. And uh, for a few days in December, the temperature was zero degrees Celsius, and we were growing apples in Bangalore at a place called Palace Archer. Now, today, if you look at we have only 193 wetlands and the vegetation cover is less than 4%. And the temperature in the region has gone up to 34 to 36 degrees Celsius. That's how the changes have happened. That is the, uh, the implication of losing the wetlands and the vegetation cover in the region. Now, when you look at the, the, the Bangalore topography, we have the interconnected lakes of uh, wetlands, the 193 in number. Now, this gives the wetlands in Karnataka, the distribution of wetlands based on the various sizes we have grouped them. Now, when you look at the ecosystem services, as I said earlier, we have looked at the provisioning, regulating and cultural services. So now to understand how the ecosystem services are provided by the wetland, for example, when the lake was there, the people were getting the water at 80 to 100 feet. After removal of the lake, we saw the groundwater table going down to 600 feet. And today in that region, after 20 years, we see that uh, people have gone down to 1,900 feet. There is no the water in the region. Now, to put it other way, when you rejuvenate the lake, there is an improvement in the groundwater table. That is evident from uh, the Saraki Lake in Bangalore, which was rejuvenated about uh, two years back. There is an increase in groundwater table by about the 80 to 100 feet in a year. Okay. So now, the, let us look at what are the tangible benefit people get from the lake. For example, Rachinali Lake, which is a reasonably good lake. The, we uh, get the goods in the form of fish, fodder, etc. to the extent of 10,500 rupees per day per hectare. When we pollute the lake or when we abuse the wetland, the worth of the lake comes down to 20 rupees per day per hectare. Now, when you look at this, the people who are dependent on the wetlands or the fishermen, washerwomen, agriculture, farmers, etc., and that section of the society get uh, affected when we pollute the wetland. That means it will affect the livelihood of the dependent people. Now, they, we have looked at the, the ecosystem services of all the wetlands in Karnataka. These are the, the district-wise, the provisioning services, regulating services, and cultural services. And when you look at this, see, you see that the, the provisioning services amount to 49 uh, billion rupees per year, while the regulating services is 196 billion rupees, and cultural services is uh, 37 billion rupees per year. That means per year from the wetlands in Karnataka, we get about 284 billion rupees per year. Now, uh, you all know that when you keep a money of 1,000 rupees in a bank at a 10% interest, you will get a 100 rupees every year. Similarly, if you are getting 100 rupees per year, you, you need to keep the 1,000 rupees in the bank. Similarly, if you are getting 284 billion rupees per year, you can find out what is the asset value of this wetland that is called net present value or the NPV. So we, we have calculated the NPV for the wetland. And this gives the total ecosystem supply value and which is aggregation of provisioning, regulating and cultural services. And this is the NPV of the wetland. And now when you look at the, the wetland, you see that the provisioning, regulating culture services, it amounts to about the 1 million rupees per hectare per year. That is the worth of the, the wetlands in uh, Karnataka. 
and uh, they they we have also looked at the coastal wetland and the aggregation of that gives the, the all the wetlands in karnataka now what are the threats to the wetland one is the unplanned urbanization the loss of floodplain loss of interconnectivity among the wetland narrowing the drain and loss of riparian vegetation now when you look at the landscape of bangalore how it has changed over the last five decades in 1973 we had 68% green cover and 7% 7.9 uh, 7% is red which are the building blue is the water body yellow is the open space now 92 if you look at in uh, 1973 the 68% was green cover that's why the city was known as a garden city then in 92 with the industries coming up in the pinni and koramangala you see the changes happening then 99 with the itpt sector coming up in the outskirts we lost the many wetlands as well as the greenery then in 2006 intensification happened 2009 further intensification and if you look at 2019 81% of the bangalore is concretized and if this trend continues what is likely to happen in uh, 2025 98% of the bangalore would be concretized the over a last five decade there has been a 1055% increase in the concrete area we have lost 79% of the water bodies and also the 88% of the vegetation in the city that is where we are insisting the government to decongest the bangalore so now when we talk about global warming let us also look at the kind of the greenhouse as get uh, get into the system when you, we have done the comparative assessment across the 10 cities in the country now when you look at the cities where the public transport is weak you have higher emission from the transportation sector as in the case of hyderabad to an extent of 54% uh, and bangalore it is about 43% now when you look at the, when the wetlands are uh, abused with the and uh, the the disposal of the untreated sewage you see that also emits the methane that contributes to about uh, you know the solid and liquid waste in bangalore contributes about 8% in the total so that is how the we see that uh, the mismanagement of the ecosystem you know with unplanned urbanization we have lost the ecosystem and there are enhanced pollution that is where it is leading to the warming of the earth okay so now these are the locations where we have lost the wetland we have lost 79% since the wetland over the last five decades now let us try to understand what are the implications of that one is that the increase in the uh, the microclimate the, the temperature what was 21 degrees in uh, 90s has become 24 degrees in 2000 or 28 degrees in the the, the 2010 and today it's about the 38 to 40 degrees celsius now to understand the importance of the wetland or the greenery we have done the analysis from the center of the city we moved in a direction you see wherever the wetlands occur or wherever parks occur the temperature is at least 2 degree lower that means this helps in the wetlands and the, the vegetation in the region helps in moderating the microclimate or they avoiding the heat island phenomena in the region now abuse of the wetland with the loss of wetland you see the flooding flooding is happening in the city quite often even today there are flooding happened in the city in some part of the city and of course there are other part of the city faces a severe water scarcity so now why the flooding happens because our lakes are interconnected when we remove the, the lake naturally that uh, the spot becomes vulnerable to the flood and when you look at the interconnectivity among the lake the interconnectivity all lakes were interconnected but today if you look at using the remote sensing data the interconnectivity among the lakes have been lost okay now how the lake is being uh, mismanaged let us try to understand people abuse the the wetland with the dumping of solid waste they encroach the thing and lake view apartment come and there is a untreated sewage is getting into the lake about 500 million liter to the belandur lake and those who are away send it through the tankers the lake which was clean the looks like this the lake when it is contaminated looks like this the profuse growth of macrophyte does not allow the sunlight to penetrate in the absence of sunlight you will see that algae do not grow since algae is not there you will see the fish population also cut down that's how the worth of the wetland come down to 10 from 10500 rupees per hectare per day to 20 rupees per hectare per day now to understand how the the ecosystem behaves when you let uh, leave some sewage here at the outlet you say what happens when the lake condition is like this and like this say when you see that at inlet the the dissolved oxygen is zero in this case but at outlet dissolved oxygen is 12 which means as the water moved from here to the here the treatment of the water has happened but in this case you see the dissolved oxygen at outlet is about 3 or 4 which means that by uh, the the, uh, the polluting the lake with the the discharge of the untreated sewage uh, every day we have 
made the leg to become eutrophic. Now that is evident in the form of frothing that happens or the fire that happens in the region, which shows that industrial contamination in the thing. This shows that domestic and industrial contamination. Okay. Now let us also understand the other impact of the, this one to understand that. Uh, let us see how people use this thing. People use the lake for fish as well as to grow the vegetables in the downstream. So now we collected the fish sample as well as the vegetables. We found that there are heavy metals in all these samples. That means the heavy metal from the pollutant from the industry are getting into our food and that is affecting the health of the people. That's where there are higher instances of cancer and kidney failure in the city. The kidney failure, which was one in one lakh about 12 years back, today it's one in 5,000. That means the number is increasing because of the poor quality of the wetlands or abuse of the wetland by discharging the untreated industrial effluent into the water body. And another aspect of, for the flooding is narrowing the drain and concretizing the drain. Okay. Now, what are the solutions? Let us try to understand. First and foremost thing is a wastewater treatment with constructive wetland and then uh, rainwater harvesting. The, then the fourth option is the mini forest in each region. And uh, the best weapon is uh, to sensitize the youth so that when they become sensible, they will be responsible so that they will take optimal decision. So which helps in the sustainable development. To understand this, let me share some of our success stories. This is the, at a place called Jakpur. We implemented a constructed wetland way back in 2010. See, in 2005, when we did a study in this region, this lake as well as surrounding, there were 25 wells were there or the water from all these wells as well as the lake had the nitrate. Nitrate is a carcinogen which introduces cancer in the system. That is where we pushed the government to rejuvenate the lake. When the government rejuvenated the lake, they implemented a secondary treatment plant. So what we did is we embedded constructed wetland and algal pond along with that. See, as you all know, that wastewater treatment has three stages. Primary treatment will remove the large particle. Secondary treatment will remove the chemical ion while the Tertiary treatment is required to remove the nutrient as our sewage consists of the chemical ion as well as the nutrient. Today, when we, we have monitored this lake as well as surrounding area for the last 10 years after rejuvenation, the, our study shows that 85 to 90 percent removal of the nutrient happening in the region. And also, if you look at the water quality, the lake as well as the surrounding borewells, none of them have a nitrate. That means this technology helps in providing the, the clean water without a nitrate for the thing. This has to be replicated in all parts of the country to ensure the sustenance of the water and uh, without any contaminant. This report is available online. Those who are interested can download this report and go through it. Then the next option is the rainwater harvesting. The city receives the rain of 700 to 850 millimeter. If we harvest this rainwater, we have 15 TMC of water. To harvest the rainwater, there are two options. One is the first is the rooftop harvesting. Individual household will have three to four months of additional water. When you harvest the rain through the lake, interconnected lake, then uh, you, the surrounding groundwater also gets recharged with the rainwater. That is how the, the surrounding area, the groundwater, the table will improve. Now, the city requires 18 TMC of water. Now, when you look at that rainwater harvesting alone, will give the 15 TMC. That means 70% of the water can be met by the rainwater harvesting. Next option is the, the sewage treatment. If you are using the 18 TMC of water, we are also generating 18 TMC of wastewater. When we treat that, you have 16 TMC of water. That means 15 plus 16 TMC, 31 TMC of water in a region where the water requirement is about 18 TMC. For this to happen, we, I have a five hour formula. First R is a responsible citizen. When people are responsible, they will rejuvenate the lake so that we can retain the rainwater and also they will allow the reuse and recycle the wastewater. So now the next is, this is the lake what we have created in IIC campus way back in 2008. It stores about 10 lakh liters of water and this is also an experimental lab for my student to working on biofuel. Not only students are happy, even we have the organisms like otter in this region. You know, at one end, I'm saying Bangalore is dying. Other end, there is a success story of the otter being in the lake. See, otter requires a lot of fish. When we did the biodiversity study, we saw that there are enough algae, zooplankton, and the fish in the system, which shows that when you uh, facilitate the region where the water body, naturally, the ecosystem is created by the nature. So the similar thing we have done, when I have met people, we have convinced to create the water body. That is what happened in this region, Murbitre, where there was a water scarcity city in 2014 and 50. When we convinced these local people about the need for having the lake, as well as this building at 32 lakes in the region. So they did it during the 
2016. You know, within 15 days, they implemented a suggestion. The success is because of the youth. And this is done by the students of the Alva Science and Engineering Colleges. And when I see the youth taking part in this, then we see a success there. Seeing the success here, we convince the Alva's uh, management to implement a lake in their campus, which stores 25 lakh liters of water. And also they took up the, the greening of the with the native species. When I visited that in 2018, you can see a greenery with abundant resource. The message here is what you get from the nature, you give back to the nature 10 times the thing. That's what I'm doing here. See, I stay on the campus. My family requires 500 liters every day, which means about 1.5 lakh liters of water I require every day. But what I've done here is I've put back the 10 lakh liters of water in the form of a lake in the region. So that means when you give back to the nature 10 times of what you consume, there won't be a scarcity of resources or poverty in the region. Now, when you come to my campus, you will see the greenery of this kind. I was fascinated by the architecture of this uh, climber. This is from Western Ghat. I felt I should have it in uh, Bangalore, that in my campus. What I did is in 90s, when I was a student, I brought this part to the campus, which had 14 seeds. Out of 14 seeds, seven seeds we planted in seven locations. Out of seven locations, in only one location it has survived. That is next to the building where I've been working for the last two decades. That means even the plants know who will take care. Now, in front of this building, we created a mini forest in a two hectares area, 49 native species, 500 saplings were planted way back in 90s. The earlier that region was infested with a wheat, parthenium. And today, when you look at the region, you get a feel of the rainforest. You see a variety of the, the fauna like slender loris and the, the numerous snakes in the region. More importantly, the groundwater, which was 150 feet earlier before creating the, the mini forest in the region, today I have the groundwater at the 5 to 10 feet which uh, substantiates that there is a linkage between the vegetation and the water in the region. And temperature in the region is another two degree lower, which also highlights how the ecosystem helps in moderating the microclimate. And this place is a hotspot for numerous, the, the birds and butterflies, etc. So the, now the last part is how we do the capacity building. We have a know your ecosystem wherein we have a tie up with various institutions where we conduct the, the, the program called know your ecosystem, which in all the orientation program and lecture, you can see the glimpses of that. And also uh, these are in schools in uh, Karnataka. They, we have conducted about 389 sessions over a period of time. And also we conduct a course on environmental management. 19 years we have conducted a session. This is for the people working in industries as well as the universities. Now the advertisement for the current year is uh, online. Those who are interested can go through it and apply for that. And that's how the capacity building, we are doing it at all level, at the children's level, as well as at the professional levels. So now the I organize a symposium popularly known as a lake symposium. The next symposium is uh, during the December 28th to 30th, and it focuses on the conservation of wetlands or the ecosystem-based adaptation of the climate change. See, the uniqueness of this event is that uh, the many experts, national and international experts take part in the event. And also, uh, in addition to that, school students and college students also take active part, and they also do the presentation. For that, children do a simple experiment like carbon sequestration or the catchment mapping, water quality assessment. Here, the kids have been trained how to collect the samples. They go and collect the samples, they analyze it. And those who are interested, my lectures are available online. And we have created a water testing lab to the facilitate these children in rural area to do the water quality assessment. See, my thinking is that when the children are aware of the, the implication of the water pollution or polluting the water, they will never allow the pollution to happen in the system. Those who want to know more details, these are available on this uh, portal. So you can uh, go through the portal. If you access the portal ending with energy, it looks like this. This is my research group uh, portal. All my publications are available online. Okay. And we are now trying to see that Aganashni in Karnataka you get the Ramsar wetland of the international importance, that Ramsar tag. So it has a biodiversity rich region. It meets all the criteria. And we also done the economic valuation of that. If you look at it, it is worth is about 5 million rupees per hectare per year, which shows how productive this ecosystem is. And it meets all the criteria, criteria the A and B. Okay. And this gives the list of the birds, etc. This uh, report is available online. Those who are interested can go through it. And you can also support our uh, this one to make sure that this uh, wetland is declared as a Ramsar wetland of international importance. So 
the work what we have done so far has uh, reached the destinations. So the work done in uh, nine, uh, 2008, the country solar program has come up. We have shown that country has the abundant solar energy. Now the, my students are working on biofuel from the algae. So if you look at the country landscape, the 65% are youth. So if we harvest all these three, we can make the country, the developed country with the sustainability of resources. Of course, when the youngsters do a good job, there is a smile on everyone's face. Thank you very much. Okay, Ananya, I have completed. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. I think it's pretty helpful yeah. to gain some form of understanding. Um, we did receive one question, if you're happy to take that. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, what are some of the biggest gaps, according to you, in Indian wetland research today? Well, you know, what is required is the kind of integrated approach. We should not have a fragmented approach. When you take the wetland, you should not end up only studying the physicochemical and biological aspect. You should also look at the hydrological aspect. So because the land use in the region is the decisive parameter for the, the wetland to survive. Once the wetland is there, how it is managed is come the second part. Okay. Now, the, the, what we need to do is the multidisciplinary research has to take place in the wetland. We need to look at the, all the aspects, including how it helps in mitigating the warming of the earth, the changes in climate, how the wetlands are resilient, and how it sustains the resources, and how it provides the, the support, supports the livestock of the people. So that's where I would say that interdisciplinary research has to happen. That's where the various departments in universities should join hand and uh, adapt the wetland in their locality and showcase that as their experimental lab as I have done in Bangalore. So I have not only made my students to take part in the thing, even I have made the schools and colleges students in the vicinity to adapt the wetland and, and to monitor that. That model should be replicated. When students, uh, the youth start monitoring the wetland, no one will have the courage to abuse the wetland or they mismanage the wetland. So then with that, uh, you know, the youth also get the sense of belonging and when they feel for the resources, so we will see the conservation happening in the region. Okay, that's what is required as of now. That's lovely, sir. And I also just saw in the chat, there's a follow-up to this. How can uh, young people interested in working on this connect with you? Well, I'm organizing a symposium now. They are most welcome to take part in that. That is scheduled during 28th to 30th December. The announcement will be available online soon. Probably the next week we are going to announce it. So, and I will share that communication with you. Maybe you can share with them. That's one way of doing it. And they can take part in the Lake of Wetland Monitoring in our region, whichever their locality, they can do the monitoring. We can virtually help them also how to do that. Okay, I think these are the ways. And the third thing is I'm also offering a course on environmental management, which will begin in uh, September to December. Those who are interested in understanding the basic concepts of the environmental management, they are most welcome to register for the course. The, the details are available on online at IIC website, as well as in the Facebook, details are available. At our NVS webpage at Facebook also, details are available, okay? That's lovely. And just as a quick note, we'll be sending out a newsletter um, after the forum, summarizing some of the information we've gotten, so we can include the materials from Dr. Ramachandra in that too, and you can get in touch with him via that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zensin and Ananya for inviting me and giving an opportunity. So I hope the message reaches the destination. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, sir. I'm sure Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, I will unshare now. Thanks. Right, so um, maybe we can take a quick two minute break uh, before we're back with another interesting session from Ms. Banani Kakar. And I'll give a bit of an introduction in a little bit, but please come back after two to five minutes and we'll see you soon. <laughs> 